Good evening. I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews. <coughs> oh, don't worry. It, it's not the coronavirus, I promise. It's, it's just a case of the vampires. <coughs> Blah. Uh, see? <coughs> Blah. Blah. <coughs> see? I'm fine. Anyway. Recently, we took a look at the first season of Guillermo del Toro's vampire TV series, The Strain. We talked all about how this brand of medical epidemic vampires serve up metaphors for the privileged, abusing the disadvantaged, and supremacist behavior impacting society on an institutional structural level. You know, amongst other things. As we discussed for season one, the strains vampires contain multitudes when it comes to symbolic meaning. And also worms. Vast multitudes of worms, slimy white worms that infect their victims and transform their organs until their bodies turn into mindless zombie-like conveyances for the single giant worm living in the throat that is the real vampire. This monstrous presence spread by those around you who seem like you, but are they really? This seed of something bigger that could invade your mind, infect your soul, and take over your whole existence. Much like, you know, fascist ideology. Because vampires are bad, sure, but you know what's even worse than vampires? literal Nazis. And season two gets further into the political and philosophical messages of the way these vampires are used. Homeland, fatherland, when politicians use these words, it usually precedes murder on a grand scale. So to recap, Guillermo del Toro came up with the idea for The Strain as a TV series about 15 years ago, but he couldn't sell it to any studios. So he turned his spec outline into a trilogy of novels with the help of a co-author. The first two novels end on to-be-continued cliffhangers, and each book truly feels like part of a story, not standalone novels by themselves. Releasing a story as three smaller books instead of one giant thousand-page book is usually always better for publishing and marketing purposes, though, so they made the most of it. The trilogy then got turned into a 32-issue comic book series, and then finally, in 2014, got made into the TV show it was always intended to be. The original plan Del Toro came up with hand-in-hand -hand with the show's producer, Carlton Cuse, who you'd best know for his show Lost was to follow the story and format of the book trilogy for a closed-ended series with a very set plan. Of course, the show would embellish parts of the books and add new subplots and characters, especially some sorely needed female characters, to flesh it out for TV. But the overall arc was set. They figured season one would be the first book, seasons two and three would portray book two, and seasons four and five would do book three, and the end. However, by the time they were planning season three, they realized they could best wrap up the planned story with only one more season, so they adjusted the schedule for a total of four seasons to tell the full trilogy. Seasons three and four are even shorter than the first two, ten episodes each instead of thirteen, because they felt that length best served the story. I always appreciate when a TV series is ex exactly as long as it needs to be, not cancelled early by the network or stretched out into a directionless mess because they think they can make extra money off more seasons. That's not to say, though, that the Strain series is the tightest, most well-structured of shows. Parts still definitely feel padded and pointless. Overall, it gets by on the strength of its horror CSI mashup premise. Action set pieces, design and effects, but it often leaves the character development and arcs lacking in places, and oof, some of that dialogue. This is crazy. You're just one girl. What are you doing? Thinking about other people. At the end of season one, the merry band of human vampire hunters tracked down the vampire master responsible for bringing the strain plague outbreak to New York City. They exposed him to sunlight, since that burns up all the other vampires, but to their shock, it didn't work, and the master got away. Season two starts with the Professor Van Helsing alike, 
Holocaust survivor Abraham Satrakian, deciding he needs to find an ancient book, the Oxido Lumen, because it holds the secret on how to actually destroy the master. Meanwhile, CDC doctors F and Nora get to work developing a bioweapon to target vampire biology while trying to protect F's angsty son, Zack. And New York City's politicians and police force attempt to exterminate the swarms of vampires through brute force. Meanwhile, all financial institutions crumble and the government implodes. There was a lot of focus on parent-child relationships in season one, lots of dead mothers. But in season two, the focus is much more on romantic relationships. The show does step away from a lot of that heavy-handed nonsense about what is the scientific explanation for love that got hammered into season one. But romantic drama dominates much of the story, especially with many of the new female characters added for the TV series. And none of the romance lasts. There's a couple frustratingly contrived love triangles for the human vampire hunter characters that have no effect on the vampire plot at all. A love interest is added for the human mastermind, Eldritch Palmer, whose wealth and power make the vampire master's world domination plan possible, but his girlfriend ends up getting fridged in the season finale for the sake of motivating his man pain. The reluctantly recruited hunter, ex-con Gus, gets a new girlfriend too, but she only exists to give him something to lose, and even though she doesn't die, he has to give her up to save her, and she's never heard from again. Beauty and love are fleeting but powerful. I've known both. I've lost both. You can save her, Gus. But the only way is to give her up. Dutch's girlfriend likewise rolls out of the show, never to be seen again, and our token queer character is left to be a love interest for the male characters in the remaining seasons. Dr. F has a fling with a politician in DC who gets killed off the day after, and then later he and Nora have an overly dramatic breakup full of visual symbolism. Look at her two nightstands. She's caught between violence and her doctor vocation, caged by circumstances. How can love even fit into a shattered vampire-y world such as this? Nora then dies in the season finale in a noble attempt to save F's son from his vampire ex-wife, and her last words in his arms are about how she loves him. Now, this character doesn't die in the books. The actress was leaving the show, so they had to write her out, but gosh darn it if they didn't find a way to do it to fuel a man's motivations. But enough about the human characters and their broken hearts. One thing season two does deliver on is more vampires. And we get a deeper look into their mysterious lore and the master's sinister motivations for bringing his strain to New York City. Firstly, remember these guys who only briefly appeared in season one? Unlike the mindless masses of zombie-like vampires overtaking the city, which Satrakian calls Strigoi, this team of vampire ninja commandos seem to have full control over their senses and are going around killing the infected citizens of the city as best they can. So they're good vampires. We learn their leader's name is Vaughn, and he works for these three vampire ancients. Apparently, there are seven vampire ancients, and the master is one of them. Any Strigoi created from the master's worms become completely subjugated to him. This is all symbolic of capitalism's exploitation and zombified labor processes and the myth of upward mobility. The master has full mental control over them. He can see through their eyes and knows everything in their minds. He can choose if he wants to grant any of his vampire babies their sentience back, like he did with his Nazi sidekick Eichhorst. So we can presume that Vaughn and his team are similar advanced creations by these three other ancients. The Master has no connection to them, so they're able to hunt the Strigoi created from his strain without him knowing. Vaughn's recruited the human Gus to start an army of highly trained daytime vampire killers. Their first plan is to attack Eldritch Palmer, because without his help the Master won't have the corrupt political influence he needs to succeed. They fail spectacularly. Oh, bye Vaughn, you, you were cool while you lasted. We don't know much about the ancients yet, but the fact that they disapprove of the Master's world domination plan and want to stop him is promising. They offer Satrakian their support in his attempt to find the Oxido Lumen book, but we learn they don't want him to actually read it and use it. If he learns how to destroy the Master, he'll be able to destroy them too, after all. Stopping the master is less important to them than getting this MacGuffin, I mean book, for themselves. 
After Vaughn's demise, a new Vampire Ninja Commando character comes flying into the season to bitch the ancients out for failing to control the master and to throw shade at New York City. Pitiful, this city of New York. This is a factory. Well, excuse you. This is Quinlan, who everyone calls the Born. We don't know what that means yet, but considering the fact that he has a nose and can go out during the day, I'm guessing he's basically the same as Blade, and he was born from a woman who was infected while pregnant or something. I wouldn't be surprised if Blade were a deliberate influence for this. We know Guillermo del Toro's a huge comics fan, and he did direct the second movie after all. We learn from a flashback Quinlan used to be a Roman gladiator in oldie times, and now he tells the ancients he'll take care of the master for them, but for personal reasons. I will stop him. But for my own reasons. I'll make you scream out in agony, as I did your mother. Ah! It's clear he's not interested in saving New York, or humanity in general for its own sake. Even as an ostensibly good vampire, he is still apart from humanity, and is only serving his own ends. Neither vampire nor human, the last of his kind, an isolated outcast, so badass and yet so alone. A character many people watching might find relatable for the contradictions of the human condition, the disconnect many people feel from the world around them, especially when we recall the themes of isolation hammered in through season one. Unfortunately, Quinlan doesn't get to do much else for the rest of the season. He briefly pops in for a couple fight scenes with his bone sword, then re-recruits Gus and they plan to start their own army, which finally gets to have a moment in the season finale, but for someone who's supposedly like the secondary protagonist in the books, he's barely in this season at all. At the very end, he means to get the Oxido Lumen away from Satrakian for the Ancients, but Satrakian quickly convinces him that they'd be better off teaming up and using the book to actually stop the Master. And they ride off into the night on a boat as the season credits roll. The opening prologue of the first episode, one of the only bits this season actually directed by Guillermo del Toro, gives us a bit of the Master's backstory. We see how he routinely transfers his worm consciousness from body to body. And after being burned at the end of season one, he now needs a new host body. His Nazi psychic hopes he'll be chosen, but in an act of super catty ponage, the Master instead transforms into Bolivar, the obnoxious musician character from the first season, and Eichhorst is left to continue doing his bidding and grunt work. One of his first tasks this season is to gather a busload of blind children to turn them into yet another new type of vampire. They have unique abilities, sight and perception beyond the visible spectrum. Behold the feelers, the children of the night. The feelers, cause get it? They're blind, so they have to feel things and use echolocation apparently, like bats, worm bats. <laughs> yeah, it's a dumb name. So for the rest of the show, they're mostly just called the spider kids. They're much more unpredictable and scary and harder to kill than the shambling zombie like Strigoi that dominate the city. So they raise the stakes of the action sequences, keeping the audience from getting bored with seeing the same kind of vampire fights over and over again. But beyond their cinematic functionality, they, represent the way innocence is abused by the powerful. These children are literally blind. They cannot see the danger in front of them and walk right into a trap set by the Nazi who pretends to offer kindness and protection before warping these impressionable youth into brainwashed tools for his supremacist mission of domination. Thanks to the feelers, Vampire Kelly, Dr. F's ex-wife and Zack's mom, also gets more to do this season. Rejoice, Kelly, for you have an important role to play in the Master's great vision. To that end, he has bestowed upon you the blessing of a new family. Because, you know, the feelers are children and, you know, children need a mommy. 
Ikorse tells her the Master has granted back her sentience and memories, and then gives her a makeover so that she can be the leader of the Feelers and use them to track down Zack, which will supposedly lead them via F2 Satrakian, which is who the Master really wants. After an entire season of attacking and failing but getting away like the Shredder in a 1980s Ninja Turtle episode, she finally succeeds in snagging Zack in the finale. She doesn't infect him though, which is an interesting twist since supposedly the Strigoi's only drive is to infect their loved ones. Zack's attitude, this entire series so far, refusing to believe his mother could truly be lost to the vampires, despite repeated evidence that she is a blood-sucking monster, is representative of the willful blindness many people have about their loved ones as they succumb to the institutional supremacist influences. Sure, my mom's working with the Nazis now, but she's not that kind of Nazi. I mean, vampire. Surely not. Ah! Until it's too late and the damage is done. Ah! Speaking of Nazis, this season reveals Eichhorst's backstory of how he was originally seduced by the fascist ideologies. We learn he was a weak-willed radio salesman who felt powerless among his peers and directionless in life. He was looking for something, anyone to blame but himself for his lack of social success. And when he hears a Nazi speech, he's inspired, latching on to blaming the Jews for all ills. This makes his Jewish love interest reject him, leaving him feeling even more impotent. But by joining the Nazi party, he gains power over others, inspiring fear wherever he goes, and finally feeling like he has a direction in life, and he eventually punishes her for dumping him. This turns into a stepping stone for his craving for the master's power when vampires enter the picture. A craving that is never fully satisfied as Eichhorst is passed over for being chosen as the master's new host body. Well, imagine that. I always assumed he would pick someone with a distinguished record of loyal service, like you. Instead, he selects a washed up pop star. It's not for us to question. The master does or does not. In this case, he did, but not with you. This blow to Eichhorst's ego drives him to further acts of monstrousness in an attempt to recapture his sense of power, secure his dominance, and his arc here shows how someone who even seems meek and nice to start can be seduced to darkness when their privilege leads them to feel entitlement. The very essence of the vampire is corrupt, abusive power. We see this in how a drop of their white blood restores vitality to the dying Eldritch Palmer and his girlfriend. But Satrakian also uses this method to extend his own strength and vitality. It's an interesting commentary on corruption to learn that the only way to fight this kind of power is for Satrakian to use it himself. I need this to keep living. It may be Wicked, it may mean I go to a, a fiery and horrible place when I die, but it's, it's, it's too late to stop now. I'm going to win or die confronting the master. I will not fade away as a weak old man. He has to corrupt himself with the vampire's essence as well to be strong enough to face it. And it's something he's deeply ashamed of, but he sees no other way. It's a highly political dilemma. Like... Does a truly clean politician ever have a chance of defeating a dirty one with the way the system is? The truth is, when you're dealing with a cruel and ruthless enemy... You need people on your team who can be just as ruthless. We see this dilemma mirrored in the situation with the vampire test subjects F and Nora used to develop their bioweapon. They aren't truly honest with the couple they conduct their experiments on, and previously, this kind of deceptive, unethical behavior would have been abhorrent to Nora, especially. But vampire times call for vampire measures, and her morality shifts for what she feels is the greater good. She and F use and abuse this helpless couple as they devolve into Strigoi in a way that's not so different from how the vampires use humans. Similarly, the politician character, Justine Feraldo, another cool female character added for the show who wasn't in the book, starts off like a hero, working with the NYPD to rid all the vampires from Staten Island. 
She's successful doing the same with the Red Hook neighborhood in Brooklyn, and so the mayor asks her to do it again for the Upper East Side. Now, New York's Upper East Side has the highest percentage of billionaires of any neighborhood in the world, so of course the wealthiest citizens would want their neighborhood to be next. Justine says sure, but insists every resident pay 1% of their property value to cover the costs of her efforts. She's not doing it to line her pockets, but she does want power over them, power over the wealthiest people in the city, taking advantage of their time of desperation, using their resources to further her own political climb. You can be a hero to them. They need you, Justine. You can arise. Is her hunger for success too similar to the vampire's hunger for blood. And is that bad? We see yet another side of this question when F decides he wants to assassinate Eldritch Palmer after his bioweapon plan fails. Even though this very well might solve a great deal of their problems, since Palmer gives the vampires the means to abuse the institutional system and is directly funding the building of animal processing plants for the vampires to use on humans, when Satrakian finds out about F's assassination plan, he still advises against it. Remaining human at all costs is very important, even when dealing with murderers. Is that your bit of grandfatherly advice for the day? Merely a warning from someone who's lived among monsters. He's talking about Nazis. Something changed for you in Washington, D.C. Yeah, the rules changed. I see. So, killing vampires is okay, but killing the human linchpin that allows the vampires to succeed is too monstrous? Hmm. F tries to do it anyway, and fails spectacularly. But in the end, his humanity remains intact. He's always been one of those thoroughly unlikable TV show protagonists, but he has not yet crossed the line into monstrousness himself. And the last words of narration in the season finale speak to finding a balance between those two necessities. In order to defeat the master, we must be as cold and ruthless and savage as he is, and yet without becoming monsters ourselves. Is that right? Is that the truth? Is that the way things should be? Is that the only way to win an election and improve our nation's systemic problems? I mean, stop vampires? Yeah, the strain was topical five years ago during the height of the Ebola pandemic, but suddenly relevant again. We've got the coronavirus and presidential primaries this year. Is ruthlessness the way, or will our heroes find another way, a finer vampire metaphor in seasons three and four? I am the Maven of the Eventide, and I will be back again soon to let you know. Until then, um, remember to wash your hands and don't touch your face. The symptoms are mild, but so contagious. Thank you for watching Vampire Reviews. If you would like to help me make more Vampire Reviews, consider supporting me on Patreon. If you pledge $2 per video, you get exclusive first access to these videos for a couple days before anyone else can watch them. If you pledge $10 or more per video, you get your name in the credits, like those lovely people you just saw. Thank you to everyone who supported me so far. If you can't support me on Patreon, please just subscribe to my YouTube channel, leave me comments for the algorithm, like, uh, tell your friends, you know, your friends who actually like vampires, because so many people still like vampires these days. Yeah, they're not passe. If you are in the Atlanta area, I will be attending JordanCon there in April. So look that up and come see me there. I'll announce it again closer to the dates, but giving you a heads up, I would love to see you to come out at JordanCon to see me and we will talk about vampires and YouTube and writing books and all the other wonderful things that we discuss at JordanCon. Until then, good night.